What a fantastic passage. Let's just pray as we come to look at it together before the Lord. Lord, Lord, we thank you that you're a living Lord Jesus. We thank you that we come to one who's risen again, triumphant. And Lord, as we look at these words that are so precious, really, as we look back at these events when you first announced that you were risen, Lord, we do pray that something of the thrill of that might just etch itself into our minds and our hearts. And Lord, may we respond as we look at this passage this morning. So we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now we're looking at a, a series called The Questions Jesus Asked. Um, I don't know if we've got the overhead mark, have we? Um, but this question was raised in a graveyard. So it's kind of an odd place to have a question asked. Um, why do you look for the living among the dead, was the question. It wasn't actually asked by Jesus, or it's called the questions Jesus asked. It wasn't really asked by Jesus, but it's probably the most important question that we could ever be asked, and I believe the most important question you as individuals and I as an individual need to answer. See, the modern trend is to um, have cremations. Um, in fact, the last couple of funerals I've been to have been cremations, I think, and that seems to be the modern trend. But in the mo- most of the people, going back a few years, it was always a burial. And I'm sure you've noticed the trend has moved away from that. And right from when I was a little boy, I was interested in graveyards. <laughs> Particularly looking at... Um, the stones. I like the gravestones. I know you've ever done this, but wandering around a grave. When I was very young, I used to take a little, little piece of wax, you know, and, a, a thing, and I used to, you know, make an etching, as it were, of the tombstone, and that was something I used to do. Quite a morbid hobby, really, isn't it? But uh, I also remember playing tricks on people in graveyards, which will go without saying. But I did spend quite a bit of time as a child wandering around graveyards, and some of the things you see are wonderful tributes. You see, written on gravestones, some fantastic tributes to people who were dearly loved. Really important. And I've reflected on long lives lived. And uh, sadly, they're now over, and you can see that on the tombstone. And I've grieved over the lost years of children who've been taken at a really young age. Have you ever looked at a tombstone and thought, how awful? Just a few months old, and there's a tombstone, remembering that child. And I've come face to face with my own mortality when wandering around a graveyard. There's something quite quite special about it, isn't there, as you're suddenly faced with all these people that have passed from this life and you're wandering around in that position. And I visited to be present at the burial of a friend or a loved one. But when you visit a graveyard, the one thing you realise is you're surrounded by dead people. It's a pretty obvious thing to say, but it's true. When you go there, you're surrounded by dead people. And one day, you too will be dead. So it's a quite poignant, quite strong thing to visit a graveyard. It was um, Benjamin Franklin who said, In this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. But years before the Bible had anything to say about this, um, sorry, years before this was said, the Bible said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's in Romans 3.23. And Romans 6.23 said, the wages of sin is death. So Benjamin Franklin was right, really, is that in this world, Nothing can be certain except death and taxes. It's the thing that unites us. We can be the richest person or the poorest person. We can be old or we can be young. We can have a very successful and powerful career or not very much. But we are united in the fact that we will one day die. And we know that death is a certainty. And that's why I think this is a curious question that the angels asked. Where do you look for the living among the dead? Why do you look for the living among the dead? No one comes to a graveyard to visit the living, do they? I certainly didn't. I went to see the tombstones. The women came to the garden tomb on this first Sunday after Jesus had died to pay their respects to their dead master. 
and friend. And if we look at verse 49 of the previous chapter, these women, it says, had followed Jesus from Galilee. So they'd come on a journey of about 68 miles to get there. 68 miles. Would have taken them about 17 hours. So it's no small journey. These days we'd hop in a car, I guess, but in their case it would have been a 17-hour journey. And they'd seen all of the events leading up to his crucifixion. And they stood by the cross at a distance watching him die. Imagine the emotional impact of that, you know, on these women. They stood and watched Jesus, the Master, die. He was the one they believed was their Messiah. This is the one who they believed was coming to set them free from the Romans. And now he was dead. And verse 56 goes on to say this. But they followed Joseph of the previous chapter this is, as he took the body down from the cross and carried it to the tomb. And it says, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. So these women come a 17 mile journey, they've watched him die, then they follow Joseph as he's taken the body. And then they see Joseph lay the body in the tomb. Imagine how they felt. Totally distraught, let down maybe, disappointed but certainly emotionally all over the place. And then we read in the same chapter, then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes to anoint his his body. But obediently they waited until after the Sabbath. I find that quite incredible. Imagine the Sabbath day. They could do nothing on that day because they wanted obedience to the God who just, in their view, taken Jesus away from them. I don't know how they would have handled that mentally, but they would have had a whole day to contemplate what was going on. And they might be asking, why had God allowed that to happen? Why had God, who was supposedly the one they worshipped, the reason they were honouring the Sabbath, why had God let them down so badly? And so these women have come to the tomb early in the morning to seek to anoint the dead Jesus' body. They come to seek the dead among the dead. They come to seek the dead among the dead. So the question the angels asked was very curious. Why do you look for the living among the dead? They weren't expecting that because they come to look for the dead among the dead. They were being asked a very curious question because no one seeks the living among the dead, do they? It's not logical. But you see, this was also a very pointed question. Why do you look for the living among the dead? After all, these were followers of Jesus, these women. They weren't just any old people. His disciples had been told many times by Jesus that he would die and rise again. In Luke 18, 31, we read these prophetic words of Jesus. We're going up to Jerusalem and everything that was written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him and kill him. On the third day he will rise again. But we read, just in verse 32 of that chapter, the disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them and they did not know what he was talking about. So if the disciples didn't understand it, hardly surprising that the women didn't understand it who were walking alongside the disciples. All of the people, of all of the people, they should have been the ones, shouldn't they? The disciples, the followers of Jesus should have known that Jesus would do what he said he would do. They should be expecting to celebrate his resurrection because he told them that's what he'd do. But they weren't. They came to this place of the dead. Chapter 8 of Romans, verse 2 says, Through Jesus Christ, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. (coughs) See, they didn't understand that. They thought that Jesus was setting them free from Rome. Not this is about freedom from sin and death, but freedom from Rome and oppression from Rome. The women were looking for the dead body of Jesus among the other dead bodies. And so came to find with shock 
what we read in our reading. The stone rolled away from the tomb and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. It was one trauma after another for these women. They'd had right enough of it. You could say they had a belly full for the last few days. You wonder how emotionally they could cope with what was going on. You might have hoped from excitement, for some excitement, some celebration from these women when they found the tomb empty, given what Jesus had told them. But we read, they were wondering about this, we read in our reading, they were wondering about it. They didn't celebrate it because it didn't enter their minds. And when the angels came to ask this question, they were wondering, what's all this about? What's happening? What's going on? And I guess maybe if we'd been there, we'd have been much the same. Verse 5 tells us that in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. They couldn't see what Jesus said would have happened. Would happen. They just couldn't accept it, couldn't see it at all. And so the two angels had to remind them that Jesus had told them about this. They told them about this. And we read, the women suddenly, the word suddenly is important, the women suddenly remembered his words. How easy it is to forget the words of Jesus, especially the really important ones. These women have forgotten all about it. And then suddenly they remembered his words. Can you imagine the moment when it suddenly registered with them that Jesus had risen from the dead, because he said that what he would do. Yes, he died, but now he was alive. Incredible, staggering. They couldn't have hoped for this in their frail situation when they came all the way up to see him at the cross. Because he conquered the one great enemy that we all have, and that's death. And suddenly, suddenly the women registered it. But there's a, a vital question. Why do you look for the living among the dead? The word dead is important here. They come to worship the living Lord Jesus. No, they come to bind a dead Lord Jesus. That's what they come for. They come in to wrap up a corpse rather than worship the Lord Jesus. Completely different motive they come with. Why do you look for the living among the dead? It's a vital question for us to answer. Most of the world behaves as if God's dead. That's the, the, the relevant part of what society does these days. Uh, last year we had a film in ABC called God's Not Dead. God's Not Dead. Fantastic film. Sometimes, unfortunately, as Christians, I think we behave as if God is dead. Just because society does. And we don't really recognise that he was the one who declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's John 14, 6. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will still live even if he dies. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he says in John 10, 10, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. So having said that, why do we look for Jesus and life, as the women did, in all the wrong places? That's the question. Why do we look for life and reality in all the wrong places? You see, we try to fill our lives with entertainment, with films, with football, with concerts, with money, with relationships, with power, and many other things, but none of them are long-lasting. None of them are long-lasting. When we ran our Alpha courses, we often used the question, is there more to life than this? Peggy Lee, this dates me a bit, Peggy Lee made a song several years ago, a sad song about her father rescuing her from a house fire, taking her to the circus, about her falling in the oven, looking back on her life with disappointment. She sings, is that all there is? And then the chorus says, if that's all there is, my friend, then let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball if that's all there is. 
And you know, that's pretty true. If that's all there is, just go off and have a great time. Enjoy life. Don't care about what you do or anything else. Just if that's all there is, there is nothing to worry about. Is there? You might as well live, drink, have life and be merry until you die because that's all there is. The problem is that those things don't last. And when you're on your own, and I've experienced, I'm sure you have, when the things wear off that you thought were worthwhile, you realise there's a bit that's dead inside you. Particularly if it's been something for which you're ashamed. The problem is these things don't last. And even our families, and that includes our husbands or wives, who are precious gifts of God, are not the source of true and everlasting life. They're not. They, like us, are dying. Every one of us in this room is dying. Every one of us. It unites us all. We're in effect looking for the meaning of life amongst the dead when we put our hope in the things that surround our daily lives, when we go for our work, when we go for entertainment. I'm not saying these things are wrong, but when we place our hope in these things, we're looking for life among the dead. It has no hope. It has no benefit. Because Jesus... God alone is the source of everlasting life. And he proved it by raising Jesus from the dead. And that's why this question is so important. But it's a challenging question. And it's challenging because 1 Corinthians 15, 13 to 20 says, if there is no resurrection of dead, then not even the Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. We have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Christians who don't live in the reality of the resurrection need pity. And when I live outside of the hope of the resurrection, I should be pitied. It's a serious issue. Where do we place our faith and our hope? But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And then in verse 54 it says, When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, and the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. See, the answer to this question determines our eternal future and our eternal relationship with Almighty God. And we need to be remember to be challenged like the women were challenged, to remember that Jesus died, but he rose again. Hallelujah. We've sung our hymns this morning about the resurrection. And we say we believe it, but sometimes I think you get more enthusiasm at a, a Six Nations match than you do in church. You see, if we were really enthusiastic, I think we'd all leap out of our seats and say, Hallelujah, we'd say, and make a scene perhaps. But we're so unimpressed and so familiar with the resurrection that it leaves us sometimes cold. And we're British after all, so it's only for rugby and football we can show enthusiasm. Not the risen Christ who's conquered death forever forever. And because he conquered death and we place our faith in him, we can have victory over death. We can have eternal life now, which takes us this life into glory. We dare not live our lives seeking the living among the dead. We dare not, not as Christians. Walking through the graveyard of life, getting downhearted, grieving, intent on using perfume and spices to make the realities of a dying world seem more bearable. Because in a sense, you know, when we try to cover up things with the spices and the, the fancy bits of life, we're trying to dress up deadness and make it look slightly more alive, when it's not. It's not where our life is. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. 
It's a fantastic truth. And I just want you to grasp that this morning because we don't seek the living among the dead. We don't. They were seeking the living or should have been seeking the living among the living. And the only place to find the living is Jesus. Romans 8, 22, 24 says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves have been the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. We need to realise Jesus is alive. He died on the cross to bear the judgement for your sin and for my sin. And he rose again to offer us new life. And we need to be in excitement of that fact that we have eternal life and we need to hold on to the things of this life lightly in comparison with our Lord Jesus, who for us is life itself, eternal life itself. We need to help other people to find their way out of the graveyard and to find eternal life from themselves. That's what we do as Christians, or should do. I want you to look at this as I finish. When my dad died on Easter Sunday, Saturday, just before the resurrection morning in 2009, I was so sad. And I missed my dad still. I had to tell my mum I was putting this up, but actually she's not here today, she's not very well. But um, I wanted to put this picture up because to me, this is quite important. When I went to visit his grave in Swansea, I was not sad but rejoicing. I wasn't sad. I was sad because I'd lost him. But I wasn't sad because he was dead. Because he'd gone to be with his Lord. He was seeking, or I was seeking the living among the dead. There, literally. Because he is not dead. He's alive. Because he knew Jesus as his personal saviour and spent a life serving him. And you see on, on his stone, it's got Ron Bennett at home with his Lord, greatly loved and missed. And there's his face. And I still find it quite moving to put that up there. But when I went to the graveyard, I wasn't seeking the dead among the dead, like the women were. I was in that case actually seeking the living among the dead, although he wasn't there, because I knew he was living. And all that was there was the shell that was left of him. Dad knew Jesus as his Lord and Saviour was not in the graveyard because his heavenly home was his destiny and is my destiny and yours if you give your life to Jesus and truly live every day. And I think that's so important. There's not a more important question. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Find Jesus for yourself. Realise just how important his resurrection was because it destroyed death forever when we place our faith in him. And we can know what it is to have a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And ultimately when we pass from this life, we go, like my dad, straight into his presence. So I want to be like my dad, living forever because of Jesus. And that's what I hope you want to be as well. Nothing to do with us, but because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just listen to this song as we finish this morning.